the agenda for today's going to start and try to up to power through things quickly. Um, this is going to be on uh, e courses, and I'll tell you after John is down. Uh, this is part of, will be part of my whole technical lecture five. It's just this slide will be up here first. So the plan for the next few days. Um, today, um, so this was written from Professor Knox's perspective, just to be clear. So the I is not I. <laughs> um, so the two of us will lecture for 30 minutes today, and at least 20 minutes for student discussions in the project. That's the plan. We're going to do our lecture first. Um, Wednesday, I'm going to lecture full time. Um, and actually, this is one we actually should be up here. I'm hoping that on Wednesday, I will be able to finish what I'm calling the background material that we need to cover in order to be able to start having a discussion about, um, about the topic that I him, which is more directly weapons. Okay. Um, and then, uh, let's see, even on the 12th, um, Professor Knopf will lecture for 60 minutes, and um, then Carl will give just a short addition. I'm really actually kind of make it more time than this one, because if I'm lucky, I'm going to be done on Wednesday, and it really won't be much for, for, for a professor to ever recover. But I am back in Washington again, unfortunately, for a short time. And then, um, actually, on 214, I'm hoping it won't be on reactions, but we'll actually be launching into our first real discussion about weapons. And I realized by that that I should tell you why I've been doing what I'm doing. So I'm resisting my main force of will, a tendency to want to talk about nuclear physics, and just give you the specifics that you need so that you can actually understand how weapons do what they do um, and how we as a nation made our technical decisions about how first to develop weapons during testing how to ensure their robustness and reliability during that next generation, which we call stockpile stewardship, which is really where I spent most of my career. And then most recently, as we moved into this new fear of non-state actors and started thinking more about the counterproliferation and counterterrorism mission. So you need to know enough about weapons to be able to understand that topic better. That's what the goal of this is. So the classic picture and the completely unclassified one of a weapon is this. It kind of looks like a scary bad robot icon, doesn't it? Um, this is the primary, which is a fission device. This is the secondary, which can be a blend, but generally speaking, that's what we call, that's where most of the thermonuclear yields come from. And the thing encompassing the two of them is called the channel where energy from the primary gets directed towards the implosion of the secondary. The, um, the minute we get into this topic matter, there are a whole bunch of sensitivities. And I'm going to be going back to the core this week to get some more guidance about what I can say and how I can address things, okay? Um, particularly when it comes to response to questions. But what we've been focusing on up till now is the primary, which I'll say is on the left. Okay, that, that's where things start. And the primary energy source for the primary is fission. And so we've been talking about fission up to this point. We're going to hopefully finish that today. You're going to not know everything there is to know about fission. Nobody knows everything that there is to know about fission. This is an active area of research right now and very interesting in its own right. And I'm not going to tell you much about that other than to occasionally point it out with a wistful look in my eye. Okay? But truthfully, what you do need to understand, I'm going to try and present. A lot of it is captured just in this table. This is reduced out of a previous slide that I showed you before. Basically, fission gives you about 200 MeV per reaction. That is per 236 nucleons, if this was neutrons on U235, or 240 nucleons, if this was neutrons on U239. Okay? That's an important number to keep in mind. Um, raise your hand if you don't know what a mole is, besides a small, furry, ugly animal. It's okay if you don't. I want to know if I, because if everyone knows what a mole is, I'll go beyond that. Thank you. Extra points for participation. That takes me nuts. Okay? A mole is really a weird unit, and it's not a, just a small furry animal. A mole is a very big number. Okay? 
times 10 to the 23rd. It is the number of atoms that you need of a given thing so that the mass that you have in grams is equal to its molecular weight, hence mole. Okay? So in other words, if I want to have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 carbon-12 atoms, I will have 12 grams of carbon. That's what, that's what it is. The reason why I bring this up is because scale is important here. When we talk about 200 MeV per fission, I would need to have, if this was U235, I'd need to have 235 grams of uranium-235 completely fission so that I could get 200 MeV times that number in energy. Okay? And remember that something like 10 to the, that, you know, this is a very big number. You're going to see it come up again, and it's reciprocal come up again shortly. But most of the energy comes out in the fission fragments themselves. The nucleus falls apart. It actually unleashes all of that electrical energy, the stored electrostatic energy, right? Those 92 protons confined in narrow distance. It releases that, and most of it comes out in just the kinetic energy of those two fragments coming out. And that is really fast. That happens in a 10,000th of a femtosecond, okay? So most of the energy efficient is immediately released. The neutrons that come out, these come out from the fragments themselves because they're so excited. They have about another 5 MeV of energy. What's more important about them is that they can then go on to induce other fission events. And that's a chain reaction, which is something that we'll be discussing as I start getting more directly into weapons. Um, then there are some prompt gamma rays. You'll learn about gamma rays today. These are high energy photons. Some gammas from the fission products, the beta particles, neutrinos that we don't actually get to see, the totals up to around 200. So this is the most important thing to keep in mind. And remember also that when I say NPD, just remind you of your toolkit, this is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. It's a really small number, except when you remember that I was talking about 10 to the 23. So multiply those two things, it's not small anymore. It starts to look like kilotons. So, here's the chart of the nuclides that we've gotten familiar with. Let's start up here with U-235, and let's look at the proton to neutron ratio for U-235. It's about 0.64, okay? Whether you do this U-235 or U-236, if I run into that in your figure, it's the same thing. Okay, so about two-thirds, the two-thirds are neutrons, one-third is protons, okay? So if I split, this thing up evenly, I would end up, interestingly, at palladium, which is equal 46, around palladium 115, 160, okay? But that's not the way that fission works. It doesn't split the nucleus down the middle. Not the fission that powers reactors and weapons. There's very interesting fission that I like to study where it is symmetric, that's called legend. That is not the case here, okay? The truth is, it's a big, broad distribution, and I had a plot about this from a paper that I've written with a former postdoc of mine, um, where we measured that distribution. We're very interested in knowing more about it. Sometimes you get things with a very big mass spread, sometimes they're closer, but the, the even one, it's really rare. It doesn't happen. Okay? Now, the exact whys about that are beyond this course, but I'll give you a little bit of a further understanding of that as we go forward. Okay, so the big thing to note here is that if you take a nucleus with a z over n of 0.64 and you split it up, the products that you're going to have in general tend to have too many neutrons in order to be stable. We need it in heavier nuclei, we need to add more neutrons basically to space away, you could say to space away the protons, or if you remember from previous pictures that I had, the proton barrier, the proton well looked like this, but the neutron well, in contrast, looked like this. It was deeper. Okay? And so you could accommodate more neutrons. Again, it was always that Coulomb force that was driving things. So if you end up with too many um, neutrons, to be on this central black stability valley, what will the nucleus do? What will it do if it's got too many neutrons to be stable? 
What? Data decay. Minus. What's that? Data, data minus. minus decay, which is, turns one of those neutrons into a proton. That's all. It falls in the more filled well into the less filled well. That's it. This is a cartoon showing what the U-235 fission fragment yield sort of kind of looks like. Actually, it turns out the number was polonium 115, 116 was the midpoint. Yeah, there's almost nothing down there. It's mostly in these two other big mass peaks, one that's roughly around 95 and one that's roughly around 136. And so if you look at one of these, for example, Xenon 140, okay, it has a 14 second half-life, which is the concept we're going to go into in great detail in this class, but it's the amount of time it takes for half of your nuclei to decay. And then it will decay to cesium-140, which is 64 seconds, which will decay to barium-140, which is 13 days, to lanthanum-140, which is 40 hours, and eventually to cerium-140, which is stable. The same thing happens on the light mass chain. We start here with strontium-94, go down to yttrium-94, and on to zirconium-94, which is stable. Okay? There'll be multiple steps of this decay process that are going on. Why do I draw your attention to this? One of the big things that we need to understand after a weapon has gone off is what was it made of? How well did it perform? These questions are well answered by looking at these longer lived fragments. Now, 64 seconds, that might be a bit challenging. But 13 days, you better believe we want to know about 13 day fragments. Because if I see them in debris, this is going to tell me something about how the weapon performed. Okay. When we used to go down hole, anything that was less than about three days was a target. You could try to look for that because it, it takes some time to dig into a deep <coughs> slag pit of radioactivity and pull out things and not dose all of your precious nuclear chemists up too much in the process. But that's it. The bottom line is, as you pointed out, it's beta decay. And goes to Z. Now, once you undergo beta decay, the nucleus is not necessarily left in its lowest energy state. Okay? So, this is something we haven't discussed up to this point, even though I love this stuff, but I think I'm holding myself back nuclear structure. The truth is that nuclei aren't just in one, they can't <laughs> just exist in one state, they can exist in excited states. And these excited states do not necessarily decay by beta decay, nor do they decay by alpha decay. They just release their energy in the form of a kind of photon called a gamma ray. In fact, that's how we define a gamma ray. A gamma ray is a photon that's given off from the nucleus. It, sometimes it has more energy than an X-ray, sometimes it has less. But if it came from the nucleus, we call it a gamma ray. You can think of it as the third type of radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma. What I have here is a partial, this is called a level scheme. These are the energy levels in carbon-12. The ground state of carbon-12, in other words, the lowest energy configuration of it, is down here at 0, 0, MeV. That other number that I have that distinguishes it here, the 0 with the superscripted positive, is something else about that state. It happens to be about, you can think of it, how fast it's rotating. And the positive thing has to do with how it will rotate under a mirror reflection. That's not important. The important thing to note is I can have carbon 12 at 0 MeV, or I can have it at 4.4 MeV. I can't have it at 2. That's not an option. That's a little weird, because normally you think about it a little droplet, you could just heat it up partially, right? You could just put less energy in. The nucleus will simply reject any attempt to put energy between these two values into it. We say that the energy is in chunks, or quanta, and it's quantized. Again, that's beyond the realm of this class, but you do need to understand this, because it creates what we call the forensic signature. In the meantime, if you want to have a way to think about this, a perfectly correct analogy is to think of the nucleus as being a guitar. Okay? A guitar can be a string, it's strung between two points, 
and it will vibrate in a specific way. One way is the first harmonic. Okay, it's just fluctuating up and down, like I drew here. You can then excite it to a second harmonic, like this, or a third. Okay, on up. But the reason why this happens is because the string is bound on either side. And that's actually the same thing with the nucleus. Basically, the protons and neutrons that make up the nucleus are only free to stay inside the nucleus. So any sort of vibration they do has to be bound up within it. And this gives rise to quantization. That's what you have over here. Really, it's a nuclear cord. Each one of these things. It's not quite a single note. There are several that contribute to that. Okay, and I'm very interested in ones that have lots going on. But that's that's there's no other reason to think any more deeply about this than that. The reason why it's important is because if you are in, say, this 4.4 NEV state and you decay by the emission of a gamma ray, that gamma will have precisely 4.4 MeV minus a tiny amount of the recoil over your it won't have any value, it will have that value, which means it's very easy. If you see that 4.4 mini gamma ray, you know there has to be carbon nearby. This becomes a fingerprint. And furthermore, these states are often fed in beta decay. Okay, like I have this example here of astatine 211, which is a promising medical radio. Okay. that has a feeding, a small weak feeding here to this state here in polonium 211. What does that mean? It means that when astatine, which is 85 protons, turns one of its protons into a neutron and becomes polonium 211, 0.274% of the time, it feeds this state and then a gamma ray comes out with 687 keV of energy. You see that gamma ray and there's a good chance that you have polonium 211. And if you're seeing that, and it seems to be decaying away with a half life of 7.214 hours, then you know that the parent is there. Even though the gamma you're seeing is from the daughter, polonium, it's being fed from the decay of the parent, astatine. This is really valuable. You can look at gamma ray spectra, and you can tell what nucleus is present. Okay? That, this is an example of a gamma ray spectrum that has been observed in a detector. It is a flawed detector, as we all are at some level. Okay. It's got a background, okay? But look at how crisp and sharp this, this is, okay? You really can go in and start labeling these peaks, and you have complete confidence in what you're looking at, or near complete confidence. Of course, you need to know, like if you look at this list here, does it make sense that this business 214 gamma, this business 214 gamma, this business 214 gamma, this business 214 gamma are in the ratios that you expect? But that's the job of the nuclear data community, and that's what we do. We try to do as best as possible to give you correct values for that. So as I said, gammas are electromagnetic radiation. They're like radio waves, light, ultraviolet light, x-rays. Typical energies, 10 kilovolts to 10 MeV. If you get much beyond 10 MeV, the nucleus is more likely to emit one of its protons or neutrons than a gamma, but you can have that occasionally. Um, it's generally prompt, meaning that it happens right after the excitation process that forms the state. But sometimes that's not the case. There's some very interesting cases, um, including some that people have pandered into false weapons that for isomers where you can store the energy for a long time. Um, and again, the spectrum does usually consist of sharp lines. These are very sharp. The fact that these lines have any width has to do with my detector. They really, they're, they're incredibly sharp lines. Okay. And um, they can be an important forensic fingerprint. Now let me go back for a moment to fission. Remember we said that the distribution is not symmetric. It's kind of a broad distribution, double hung. So this is what the range of it looks like for uranium-235 fissioning, okay? It's a big, broad distribution. The stable nuclei are sort of visible here. They're long here. But basically, it's slightly to the right, which is the neutron-rich side of stable, okay? 
So basically in fission, the heavy fragment ends up being something near King 112, 32. Now, again, I'm going to hold back. I'm not going to tell you why. The people who take in 101 and 210M with me have heard why. Why is interesting, and it's not important here. You could think of it as it's the place where these two lines intersect. Turns out, that's what we call sig a magic nucleus. Okay, because everybody wants a little bit of magic in their lives. All of these numbers, 50, here they are, 2. I'm going to show two down here. You can write it on there, right? Two, eight, twenty, twenty-eight, fifty, eighty-two, one twenty-six. These are very stable configurations. Nuclei that have that number of protons and neutrons have a little bit of extra stability. So the fission process tends to give you one nucleus on that point because the intersection of the fifty and eighty-two lines happens to fall in about the right place for fission to happen. It's random. If I fission a much heavier nucleus, this wouldn't be special anymore. But in these cases, it is. So as I like to say, fission gives you a nucleus near 10132 and the other one, and whatever is left. Yes? And does the other, the lighter fragment, does that experience beta minus decay for a stable pulsar? Good question. Does, does it experience beta minus decay? Yes, almost exclusively. There's a very small subset of fission where the fission process actually produces a nucleus that is stable from the get-go. Those are called shielded nuclei. They're very rare. They're actually quite interesting, especially to nations that have a nascent nuclear weapons program because they directly can give you an indication about what happened in the device. But the vast majority end up, whether it's heavy or light, they end up neutron-rich. So they undergo beta minus. It's a great question. Thank you. Now, I want you to do a quick comparison here, because one of the big questions that you want to answer in the event of a domestic nuclear event is, did the weapon have uranium-235 in it or plutonium-239 in it, right? That's important to know, because it tells you something about the capabilities of your adversary. You'd like to know more about what's in the weapon, but those, that's sort of the first and fundamental question. What's in that primary? Okay, so here is a plot for the fission fragment distributions from U-235. Here's one from plutonium-239. See the difference? Not really, right? It's not very compelling. <laughs> I keep doing this a little while. There are some differences you can see, right? Actually, the differences are, are right now, they're sort of on the edge of where we can actually tell. So one of the things that we have to do when we just come to grips with this within the international community is we need to do a new evaluation of vision bar fields. This is an incredibly hard job. This is going to take probably dozens of people years, perhaps a decade to do. The last time we did it was for papers up through 1989. The technology's gotten a bit better since then. But there is a difference, okay? But it's not very different. And so this really is a problem if you want to figure out whether a weapon that just went off was made of uranium or plutonium. This is one of the first fundamental questions, okay? There are tricks that we can do. Students who took uh, 298 with me last semester heard some of these, okay? Um, but don't worry, we're clever. We have good tricks, and they're actually quite good, okay? So here's a bit more about vision products. I'm running, I'm down to my last five minutes, so I'm going to be pretty quick here. Okay, let me just look and see if I get to where I want to go. Yeah, this should be fine. So fission produces, as I said, a vast number of different isotopes of widely varying half-lives and activities. It's not the very short lived or the very long lived ones, though, that are either interesting or problematic, but it's the ones in between. Okay, if you want to figure out about a weapon, the debris still has to be radioactive when you get it. On the other hand, if it's super long lived, you may not ever see any radiation coming off of it, which would be problematic. That could be a problem, though, for nuclear energy systems, because if you produce a fission fragment that's long lived, that could be a problem. And actually, there again, it's this intermediate range that's a problem. One of our biggest issues is ever seen 242M, which is 141 years. That's horrible on that part. Okay, it's active enough that it's bad. It's long enough lived that it's that it's going to be around for a long time. You know, 50,000 years, you don't worry so much. It's not very active. 
you know, 10 years you waited out, 41 years, that's a bad thing. Okay. So here are the two isotopes from which one can most readily make either a reactor or a weapon. They're U-235, it's a minority component of natural uranium, 0.7%. There are four separation methods that you can employ in order to enrich it relative to the dominant isotope. Um, they are electromagnetic separation, gaseous separation, using centrifuges, which is, you can call it inertial separation, and laser isotope separation. And then there's PU239, which is produced as a byproduct in U235 plus U238 reactors and can be easily chemically separated out. And both fission upon capture of a slow neutron. Because they have an odd number of, of neutrons, when they capture one, they get that little extra bonus of energy and they're knocked out of their stable configuration. So there are a couple of great videos on fission on YouTube. I actually got these from Carl. But the first one has problems. I love this. I thought, what a gift that I got this from Carl. So I encourage you to go and look at these videos, okay, and see in the first couple of minutes of the first one, there are a few problems that perhaps you'll even be able to know if you go back and you look at my lecture slides and the, and the talks that I've given. But nonetheless, the second one, by, by the way, it's got a minor problem or two, but overall, it's very good. The, the voiceover in the first one is done by this guy with this really smooth, stuff sounding British accent, and this one is like done by some, like, very deeply sounding. Person. It's actually the better one. But you believe this one more because he sounds so cool. Okay. So, um, so this is close enough. I'm at, I'm at 28 minutes. Um, I will mention briefly. Um, I guess I could just do two, since I have 28 minutes. Right? I'm at 28 minutes. About two minutes. Let me do two quick slides on the big energy source here, for the secondary. Okay. Because now you're ready to do this. So fission releases electromagnetic energy, right? We talked about that. And it's not Indian, or it's not in India. In contrast, fusion, which is the other main energy source that we use in weapons, releases nuclear energy. This justifies calling it a nuclear weapon. You have to know, otherwise it's just a cool off weapon. It doesn't sound as good, but that's the truth. So I have probably our prototypical fusion reaction here. Deuterium plus tritium goes to helium-4 plus neutron and releases 17.6 MeV. Overwhelmingly, 9,997 times out of 10,000. That comes out in the form, just a little bit of recoil, of a 14 MeV neutron and a 3.5 MeV alpha particle. And that's because of that conservation momentum thing. The heavier thing moves more slower, okay? So the big difference between fusion and fission is that both of my initial reactants have charge. So there is now a barrier keeping the two of them apart. Okay? And the charge particles have to overcome that barrier. But both D and T are small enough to have all of the nucleons within that five Fermi range of the nuclear force. <coughs> this is the opposite end of uranium. This is actually tight enough. These nucleons are completely bound to one another. So when you bring them together, they actually fall into the well, and that's where you get the energy out. So why fusion is important? Well, this is the energy gain that we get per nucleon from <coughs> fission, right? As we're going from U-235 back up to where sort of the average of that, of the two fragments are. Look at the gain you get from fusion, okay? Now, you do have to remember that this is a plot of the average binding energy per nucleon, not the total binding energy. This is the amount per <coughs> nucleon. Uranium has 235 plus 1, the capture neutron, 236 nucleons. DT has only 2 plus 3, or 5. Okay, so that's why the energy released from fusion was 17.6 MeV, but from fission, it's 200 MeV. But fusion wins pound for pound because that's 17.6 MeV in five nucleons, as opposed to 200 MeV in 236 nucleons. Now, this is just the energetics of fusion. We're going to talk about the reactions next. 
In the next lecture that we that I give you all day on Wednesday, you're going to come in not knowing what nuclear reactions are, except most of you do, and you're going to come out um, knowing what they are in one lecture. And I'm confident that, that will be the case. Okay. So I'm I'm sorry to stop without questions, but I want to I want to get through this, and I'm going to hand off the, the, the floor now. Michael, I'm around after the class. If anybody wants to chat, I'm really happy to talk to you. Okay. You want to plug in? Um. Yeah, so we're using the camera now. Um, I got it from my fellowship. Um, we have one. I didn't realize we did. And it's a better quality one. Okay. Um, sometimes they're going to have Wait. to use. This is the same one that we have. Okay. So now back to the uh, role of the non physicist who's worried about these weapons. After all, uh, Vast amount of what Professor Bernstein has discussed is largely unknown, even to uh, to the military specialists at the time. This is that's just a, a conversation among uh, atomic nuclear physicists. <coughs> but what is known is that uh, the bombs dropped at Hiroshima and Nagasaki were extraordinarily destructive. And in fact, Einstein said afterward, he said the release of energy by an atomic bomb has changed everything but our way of thinking. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it takes humans a while to understand the significance of what has happened. Now, very quickly after the war ended, and by now, I don't know how many of you have kept up, but according to the syllabus, you should have read 300 pages of Kaplan. Now, how many of you read 300 pages of Kaplan? How many of you know what Kaplan is? <laughs> so, uh, and Kaplan is describing the evolution of the American debate about the importance of these weapons, including such key questions as who controls them? Uh, who determines how they might be used in the future, if at all? Uh, what are the key aspects of preventing use? None of which is known. It's all to be derived by folks who are living in the 1940s. <coughs> One thing that emerges quickly is that deterrence Deterrence, which has existed in the past, becomes for the first time a core element of US national security policy and strategy. So since that remains true till today, you have to understand quite clearly exactly what we mean by deterrence. So the, the term is used very cavalierly and sloppily these are the conditions that satisfy the def definition of deterrence. Abstractly, supposing you have two players, it could be two countries, two organizations, A and B. I'm asserting here that A deters B if, number one, A threatens B, that if B takes a particular action X, A will punish B. So the first condition is the conveyance of a threat, of an if-then proposition. You do this, I'll do that. Secondly, B determines that A has the will and capability to carry out the threat. And note that will plus capability equals credibility. The believability of the threat is a combination of the judgment by B 
of A's will and A's capability. I'm going to go into a, an example which will capture your attention. This is tuning you out. But uh, so that's the credibility condition. The, the third is the cost benefit calculation. B determines that the punishment it will receive from A outweighs the gain of taking the action. It's a cost benefit calculation. And then B decides not to take action X. It was originally going to, it decides not to. If those four conditions have all been met, then B has been deterred by A. Now, here is a hypothetical, somewhat whimsical, uh, but attention grabbing example of deterrence. Okay. Uh, I have two sons, that's true statement. Uh, one son used to be eight years old, that was many years ago. Uh, the next statement is not accurate, but it's good for this example. Uh, my son David was struggling in academically in elementary school. So his mother and I said to him, when you get home from school, you must finish your homework before turning on the television. Okay? Finish your homework before turning on the television. Now, you, you're not familiar with this, but in a previous era, in almost uh, uh, an ancient time, televisions were not operated by remote control. <laughs> I know this is hard to believe. You actually had to physically go over and turn it off or pull a button to turn the television on. Mr. Bernstein is not younger than I, but he, even he might remember. <laughs> this is such a time. Uh, now, in this case, I got home early from work one day, and I came into the house, and another thing of ancient American times, this is in the mid-20th century, <laughs> televisions were often in a room called the family room. <laughs> family. It's an ancient language, not, uh, not known anywhere. And Michael walks into the family room, and there is David, eight years old, walking toward the television. He's walking right toward the TV. Now he has not yet turned the television on, but it kind of smokes like a duck, walks like a duck, looks like a duck. He sure looks like he's gonna turn the TV on. And I say to David, hold on to your hat, that's your seatbelt here. I say to David, David, if you turn the television on, I'll break your arm. <laughs> now you may think this is laughable, you don't know me. <laughs> uh, now, what have I done? I've conveyed a threat to David. If you do this, I'll do that. If you turn the TV on, I'll break your arm. Now, Actually, there's an initial question here that's embedded in these conditions, which is, has David even heard the threat? Now, in the real world of a real family room, small family room, it's close to him. Yes, of course he's heard the threat. He hears well, I speak loudly, he's heard it. In the real world of international politics, it's a very noisy environment. Governments don't hear the threats of other governments. For example, when Lyndon Johnson was president during the Vietnam War, he spoke about bombing the North Vietnamese to the conference table. And he thought if they kept hitting them with enough bombs, they would negotiate. Later, after the war, some Americans visited Hanoi and spoke to the North Vietnamese leadership and said, what was your calculation after Johnson conveyed that threat? And what did the North Vietnamese say? One threat. One threat. They never heard the threat. They said, we thought you were trying to kill all of us. You know, there was no sense of a subtle conveyance of a message here. We just kept fighting and digging and tunneling, and hopefully you guys would get tired and leave. But in this case, David has heard the threat. It's very important. 
in deterrence, that the threat has to be conveyed and received by the subject of the deterrent. Okay, now then David has to determine the credibility of the threat. Do I, his father, have the will to carry out the threat? And do I have the capability to carry out the threat? Now he's eight years old, I was a lot younger then. I think there's a reasonable chance I had the capability to carry out the threat. I could have broken his arm when he was eight. Now, of course, he could break my head, but that's different. Okay? Would I have the will to carry out the threat? Would David think I had the will to carry out that threat? How many of you think David would think I had the will to carry out the threat? You think that? He's eight. He's how many of you how many of you doubt that he would think I had the will to carry out? The vast majority. Why do you think David thinks I don't have the will to do it? What is it about the situation? Yes. I guess if he's never seen a precedent of me breaking someone's arm for that kind of action, then it doesn't really register with me that's a possible. Great. One thing is lack of precedent. Yes. Is there anything else that gives you doubt that he would believe the that I had the uh, will? Yes. Uh, it's not like commensurate with the events. Yes, very significant. Proportionality. Proportionality is central to the credibility of deterrence. If, for example, someone, or a thief, was climbing through the window and looked like he was going to steal the television, and I said to him, you try to turn, turn you try to steal that TV, I'll break your arm, how many of you think that the thief would think it's a credible threat? Because it's proportional uh, to the effort that you're trying to deter. It's proportionality is subjective. It's in the mind of the recipient of the threat, not the threatener. It doesn't matter what Michael thinks, it only matters what David thinks. Okay, then David has to determine, he does the cost-benefit calculation. Would the benefit that he received of defying his father, perhaps wearing a cast for several weeks, <laughs> having his friends sign the cast, <clears throat> gloating to his friends how he defied his father, fantastic uh, plus for a young boy. Uh, does that uh, override the, uh, the pain, the difficulty, maybe spending time out of school, so forth and so on? It's a cost benefit calculation. You with me? Understanding the cost and the benefits of defying the threatener. And then if David decides, you know what, the costs outweigh the benefits. I'm not going to do it, when before he was going to do it, then David is deterred. Is everybody clear what we mean by? You have to know this cold. Okay, you got it? Okay. So, in the early 50s, when Eisenhower became president after Truman Truman was president and was popular at the end of the war with the bombings, but then later lost popularity with the start of the Korean War. You know about the Korean War of 1950? It's highly relevant to today. You've heard of Kim Jong-un. This was his grandfather, Kim Il-sung, who was selected by Stalin, the head of the Soviet Union, to leave Moscow and go to Pyongyang and take over North Korea. And a few months later, uh, Kim Il-sung decided to attack South Korea in June of 1950. <clears throat> this is a time Korea had no nuclear weapons. The Soviet Union only had a couple of nuclear weapons. The US had more nuclear weapons, but yet they were willing to attack an ally of the United States. Uh, 
After that time, uh, Truman was defeated in the election of 52, and Eisenhower became president, and his Secretary of State enunciated the first nuclear declaratory policy of the United States. This is discussed in Kaplan, and it's the doctrine of massive retaliation. You familiar with massive retaliation? Okay, and what what Bella said was that if the Soviet Union uh, engaged in aggressive acts, even of a limited nature, we would use nuclear weapons and destroy Moscow and the Soviet Union. Doctrine of massive retaliation. Now, that would mean if the Soviet Union invaded parts of the Balkans. Uh, um, the uh, uh, Yugoslavia or uh, 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 other areas of Southeastern Europe. Would, would it be credible, do you think, to the Soviet leadership that if they uh, inserted some forces into the Balkans, that the US would then use nuclear weapons to incinerate 10 million Russians in Moscow? You have a proportionality issue there. So there was tremendous criticism of the doctrine of massive retaliation. Doctrine of massive retaliation was the first US declaratory policy of nuclear weapons in the nuclear age. But it was criticized by Americans, by civilian strategists described in Kaplan, Brody, uh, um, Kaufman, and others who said it's not believable, it's not a credible threat. And it led to a retreat of that policy by the Eisenhower administration. Now, at the same time, there was another core concept that was uh, that dealt more broadly than with nuclear weapons, the doc doctrine of containment. How many of you know about the doctrine of containment? When people are not reading the book. You've got to catch up with the book. Uh, who was Kennan? Yes. The ambassador of the USSR. Well, yeah, he wasn't the ambassador. Uh, the US had had no diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. Remember, the Soviet Union was established with the Russian Revolution in 1917 and completed the revolution in 1921. Lenin was the head of the revolutionary forces. Lenin became the Head of state of the Soviet Union, but then died in 1924. I think we discussed this uh, before, didn't we? And his colleague Trotsky thought he would succeed Lenin, but in fact, it was an organizational apparatchik named Stalin. Actually, Joseph Stalin is, is a pseudonym. That's not his name. He was from Georgia, not Jimmy Carter's Georgia, but uh, Georgia in the Caucasus. And Stalin forced Trotsky out and forced Trotsky to flee. And he fled, did we, dis did we discuss this last time? He fled to where? Mexico. Mexico where that was in 1928. And in 1941, Stalin sent a hit squad to assassinate Trotsky, which they did. They uh, put an ice pick through his neck. If you want to get into gruesome stuff, study the Soviet Union. <laughs> okay? Now, uh, as the war ended, the U.S. had established diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union under Roosevelt in 1933, and Kennan was a young Foreign Service officer who served in the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. And he became extraordinarily knowledgeable about the Soviet Union when the vast majority of Americans knew nothing about Russia and the Soviet Union, nothing. No, no knowledge of the language, the history, the culture. And it's so dramatically different from the West. The West, meaning mostly Western Europe and then the legacies to the United States, are governed by three major uh, 17th, 18th, and 19th century revolutions. The Enlightenment, the Renaissance, and the Reformation. And this is a way of 
these are the precursors to a democratic society of civil discourse between groups, of uh, separation of powers, of governments, of all the precepts of American democracy and of European democracy. The Enlightenment, the Renaissance, and the Revolution never came to Soviet Russia. None. No experience at all with any of those ideas. The Soviet Union, which was established, as I said, in the 1920s, uh, was preceded by Russia, and Russia was governed by a czar who was an autocratic leader, and the autocratic leader of the czars ruled Russia from the late ninth, ninth century, when I was a young man, the ninth century, to 1917. That was a thousand years of czarist leadership without any sense of democratic virtues. And then after a thousand years of czarist leadership, the Russians were ruled by a communist regime, dictatorship of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, ruthlessly implemented by Stalin, and then by his successors, right through till 1991. So there was no connection, no experience of the Russian people to any of the vestiges of democracy for a thousand years, until 25 years ago. I don't know if you can appreciate the significance of that, but it's profound. It means they have no knowledge, no understanding whatever of the things which we take so for granted. Cannon was very worried that the American leadership at the end of the war didn't understand the threat that the Soviet Union posed. He said that they have an innate expansionist tendency. They must expand or die. They have to justify their communist doctrine by expansion. And the name of the game for the United States was to block, to counter the expansion. <coughs> and he wrote an article in Foreign Affairs magazine under a pseudonym X, because he was a Serbian Foreign Service officer. He could not reveal his name. He had written an earlier article, a classified long telegram laying this out. But this was a published account, the famous Kenan X article in the July 70, 1947 edition of Foreign Affairs, in which he said, this is the operational quote, Soviet pressure, which he said was inexorable, they endlessly want to expand and control and dominate had to be contained by the adroit and vigilant application of counterforce at a series of constantly shifting geographical and political points. Now, Kennan wrote mellifluously, he wrote beautifully, but also the language could be a little vague. And it's not clear. Some people interpreted this as using primarily military might to stop the Soviet pressure. Others said no, it was also economic and political. The main point is deterrence and containment became the central precepts of the United States policy toward the Soviet Union in the nuclear age. And that lasted right through till 1991. And these concepts are discussed today with respect to other adversaries. If you follow the public debate about US policy toward North Korea, it's in the press every single day, deterring the North Korean threat and containing the North Korean threat, these are the same concepts used today in application to new threats. Now, operationally, the U.S. had to sort of get its act together. Remember, the U.S. had a policy of isolationism and of winning wars and going home like it did after World War I. After World War II, Cannon urged the United States not to withdraw from Europe, that this would be an invitation for the Soviets to gain control of Western Europe. 
So the U.S. Congress passed a pivotal National Security Act in 1947, the same year that Kennan's article came out. And there are four key elements. We have had a Department of War, and it was converted to a Department of Defense, made a little bit more specific. But uh, it, it established a much more comprehensive approach to national security strategy. It wasn't there just to fight wars, but to defend the United States. The National Security Council was established to advise the president on ongoing national security issues. They would not vanish with the end of the Second World War. They'd be a permanent fixture of the environment. Uh, I told you that, uh, that the uh, Secretary of uh, War, Stimson, had said in the 1920s, gentlemen do not read other people's mail. It was kind of a naive view, which we later abandoned during World War II. The U.S. established its first intelligence organization in the Second World War, which was the OSS, the Organization of Strategic Services. Then after World War II, we established the Central Intelligence Agency, the first of 17 intelligence agencies that the U.S. currently has at a declassified budget level of $80 billion, which I can tell you is a low number. Okay. And finally, we had the Army and the Air Force and the Marines, uh, we had the Army and the Navy and the Marines, and the the act established the U.S. Air Force as a separate military arm. Because remember, the bombs were dropped by long-range bombers. They were under the uh, control of the Army. In the Second World War, the Army Air Corps controlled flying vehicles. But we're clearly moving into a world of Bombers are going to be hugely significant. We were in the new missile world. The Germans had used missiles to attack the British. And the Air Force became the central military organization to control nuclear weapons. <coughs> if we had been meeting here in 1946, there would have been no Air Force. The Air Force didn't exist in 1946. None of these existed in 1946. These are all central elements of U.S. national security policy and strategy today. Okay. Now I asked you about Bernard Brody. Who was Bernard Brody? Yes. Um, he was a big one academic scholar during like World War II. He was a naval, like his specialty was naval um, strategy, but then once the like the nuclear bombs were dropped, he changed his focus to Right. A core feature of the nuclear age in the United States was it, it facilitated the entry into the policy debate of civilians. Up to that time, right through World War II, any debate about military strategy was basically conducted by senior military officers and some political figures. But these thinkers said, you know what? The nuclear weapon is so devastating, it's so massive in its implications, that it cannot uh, be left just to these people. Uh, it's a military matters can't be left to the generals, which was insulting to the generals. Um, my, I think I have an alarm that's about to uh, so, the folks that are, you're going to read about in Kaplan, who were at the Institute of International Studies at Yale and at Princeton, they became initially the core intellectuals who had to think about the implications of nuclear weapons. And then, an organization was formed uh, at the impetus of Donald Douglas, of Douglas Aircraft Corporation, in uh, California, in Southern California, RAND, Research and Development. It had an innocuous name, but it was a think tank 
to study nuclear strategy. The RAND coverage. How many of you have heard of the RAND coverage? Anybody here has not heard of the RAND coverage? <coughs> have any of you seen the film The Post about uh, Ellsberg? Ellsberg lives right here in Kensington. So there's 20 minutes from here. Ellsberg was involved in two things, and one was the, uh, the release of the Pentagon Papers. The Post is the story of the release of the Pentagon Papers. And he also was a nuclear planner and nuclear strategist. Um, how are we doing? 310 my end? 310 is my end. I'm going to stop here. I urge you to read more of Kaplan. Really study it, really read it. And uh, I'll continue on into RAND studies, the RAND basin study, uh, important aspects of uh, OSC. This was also and the role of civilian strategists in shaping U.S. nuclear policy. Any questions or issues of what I've discussed? This is getting us from the 40s deep, in, deep into the 50s. The readings get you through into the 60s and 70s. I'll do that next time. The presentation is a mix of concepts and of some historical evolution. It's a mix. Any other concept, any other questions or corrections or suggestions? Okay, so thank you. Now we'll turn it over to the discussion of the project. Okay, so um, who is speaking?